On today's podcast, we are going to talk about networking and building relationships. And this is a critical thing. And I coach a lot of introverts or ambiverts or even extroverts, but especially introverts, they often talk about the challenges of building relationships and networking. I implore you to listen to this episode because we do talk about not only why networking and building relationships is so important, but the rules of the game really dictate that people get jobs, not necessarily necessarily just because they know what they're doing, but because who they know. So you're going to hear from Greg Roche, who's a guy that I met through a friend of mine and he's also on LinkedIn, who is an introvert who teaches introverts on how to network. And I myself, I consider myself an ambivert, unclear if I'm ambivert or introvert, but whatever it is, there's good information on this podcast where we talk about the importance of building relationships and making it a habit. If you need any help with your career, if you are looking to take your career to the next level, if you are looking for a better job, that's what we do best here at Academia Careers. And we do it in three different ways. We offer a do-it-yourself course called the Job Acquisition Method, which breaks down our framework, and process, including networking, by the way, which helps you to get more interviews, offers, and money. If you are someone that likes to do it in a community with a group of other people, join our group coaching program. We take a small number of people in that program and you can join with other people, have access to me, have access to some of our coaches. And finally, if you want a personalized coaching experience, much more access to me, have access to the whole suite and opportunity within Kadima Careers. We do offer personalized coaching as well. That is our most limited option. It's an application only process. We work with you until you get a better job. We guarantee you a better job. So check out our solutions. You can go to kadimacareers.com, K-A-D-I-M-A careers.com and learn more about how we can help you accelerate your career. And then finally, Before we start this episode, I'm going to leave you with the same three words I repeat over and over again, own your career. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Sick Career Podcast. On today's episode, I am very excited to have Greg Roche on the podcast. He is a self-described introvert although he is a very good networker. A friend of mine put us in touch with each other, and I'm really eager to speak to Greg, get some of his tips on how folks that are introverted or just not comfortable networking, how they can get over some of the the fear and that friction and build relationships. So with that, Greg, welcome to the Sick Career Podcast. I'd love for you to share a few words and tell the audience a little bit about who you are. Thanks for having me on, Alan. I'm excited to be here and talk to your audience today, mostly about networking, but tell you a little bit about myself. I live in Denver, Colorado, and I do a couple things. I do have a day job, so I work in HR for a large healthcare company, but the thing that I normally do when people say, what do you do is I say, I teach introverts to be better networkers. They'll usually say, how do you do that? And most of the time I'm posting on LinkedIn. I post every weekday, my tips and tactics for being a better networker. And I write my newsletter every week called the introverted networker, which is my best tips that go into a little more depth. I've written a book called the fast and easy guide to networking for introverts. And really all of this has come from my own experience. I had to learn how to network when I was laid off the first time it was about 11 years ago. I didn't know how to network. I had never networked. I hate going to networking events. If I go to an event with a bunch of strangers, people I don't know, I just find a corner and slowly back into it and hope that somebody will come and talk to me and have mercy on me. So I had to learn how to do this a different way. And over time, I I figured out what really worked for me. And I started to share it with other people I knew who were struggling with it. And they also said, hey, that was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. It wasn't that sort of dread or fear of going to events and having to shake hands and make small talk and trade business cards. And they said it actually was fun. And, and so as I got that feedback, I tried to find different ways to, to teach people about it. And that's what I've been doing for several years now and something I continue to do. It's something I really enjoy doing and I'm always happy to share 
more information with people who want to talk about it. So if anybody says, okay, tell me, how do you network if you're an introvert? I could talk for hours about it. I could go on and on. That thing where they say, if you find out what you really can talk about for hours, then maybe that's your thing. That's your niche or your topic. And for me, that's networking for introverts. Awesome. And we will use most of this podcast for that. But before that, I did look at your LinkedIn profile as I research a lot of people. And I saw that over two decades ago, you were an entertainment host at Celebrity Cruises. How did you wind up in that job? And is that a job you would typically recommend for an introvert? Because it seems like a little antithetical Uh, what an introvert would uh, succeed at. But maybe I'm wrong. I've been on cruises before. But yeah, let me know. How do you get that job? You weren't there more than a year. At the time I got the job, I was working for, at the time it was called Anderson Consulting. It's now called Accept. So I was in IT consulting in the late 90s. And late 90s was all putting in systems to deal with this Y2K problem. So for all your listeners who are old enough to know what that is, we were selling a lot of software to people because they had to upgrade their systems before the year 2000. And I was doing that in Chicago. And after a couple of years of doing that, I just felt like, I don't know why I'm doing this. I just got the job out of college. I came across this article on the internet, which was still fairly young. And I bought my first ever thing off the internet, which was a book on how to get a job on a cruise ship. I got this book and it told you how to do it. So I applied by printing out a bunch of resumes and cover letters and putting them in the mail to all the cruise ship companies. So I literally mailed my stuff to these cruise ship companies. Celebrity Cruises picked up my resume. They called me up. They said, hey, would you be interested in this? I did two phone interviews and they said, okay, can you be on the ship on November 6th? And I said, sure. I moved all my stuff from Chicago back to Colorado, which is where I'm originally from, and got on the ship as this entertainment host. And it does sound sort of not really like an introvert's job, but there's a lot of that is talking to people one-on-one, helping people, directing them. And I would say you're in a uniform. Your role is to go talk to people. So going and talking to people in that capacity is not hard because you're the entertainment host. There's no challenge of what are we going to talk about? Of course, we're going to talk about how are you doing? Are you having a good time? It wasn't that difficult, but my role kind of on the staff was I was more of the behind the scenes guy. Like I made sure that everything got set up for the activities. I made sure that people were where they needed to be. So I took on more of the guy in the back role as opposed to that guy out front that's like the outgoing person. But it's an interesting observation. It definitely challenged me as an introvert, but I just found my niche and found out where I was strongest. And it was a great experience. I got a lot of speaking in front of people experience, just being in front of groups of people. And so the best part that came out of that, the best part of the story is that's where I met my wife. She was a singer on the ship. So we worked together. We met on the cruise ship. We got engaged. And that's why I was only on there for years because once we got together, we decided we didn't want to do ships anymore. Cool. And it's interesting as you were relating your point, that it wasn't that hard for you because there were a lot of one-on-one conversations Mm -hmm. with passengers on this ship. I want to dig into that a little bit. Is it easier or do you find it easier for you or introverts to build relationships and networking one-on-one versus the uh, the example you gave earlier of going to a networking event and basically just being a wallflower uh, amongst the sea of people? So love to hear a little bit more about that. Everything I tell people is basically around connecting with people one-on-one. And many people would say, well, that doesn't seem like a very efficient way to network. You're not going to meet enough people. It's going to take forever. But I would argue your conversion rate, your rate of people you're going to create in to connections and have relationships with is going to be better if you're talking to them one-on-one, really listening to what they're saying, understanding what they're challenged with or struggling with or how you can help them and being able to help them. That's going to create the relationship much more quickly and develop that connection. And then they're going to want to help you, which is when you say to them, hey, who can you introduce me to? Or can you introduce me to this person? And to me, that's more networking than getting a list of people that you're then going to follow up with and try to have conversations with or trade cards. I always come at this from the standpoint of you need to really have real conversations to build real connections. And that's going to happen better in a one-on-one environment as opposed to a one-to-many environment. Now, of course, if I'm speaking to a group of people and they see me speaking and they're like, they want to come talk to me, okay, great. I might have multiple connections, but again, I'm going to move to a one-on-one connection with them at some point to really have that conversation, to get to know them, really 
see who they are, get to know who they are. And it's not about a quantity of connections. It's about a quality of connections. So your network doesn't have to be hundreds of people. It should be a couple dozen or 50 strong connections or people that you really could connect with at any time. And they would pick up the phone, answer the email, talk to you. Again, they're eventually going to say, oh, I know this person you should connect with. And then you connect that way. So again, if you think of it like that, if you thought of, you know, if you knew, let's just use the number 50 and that's arbitrary. If you knew 50 people that you were pretty confident that anytime you reached out to them, they would respond and they know 50 people, you're talking like 2,500 people right there, right? That you could get access to by them connecting you. And so that's how I tend to tell people to focus is really grow strong professional relationships with people for mutual benefit. So you're both working on this to help you, to help them. You're out there to help other people, not just focus on what you can get out of networking. Yeah. And I think that mutual beneficial part is so key. So when we coach people at Kadima Careers, we teach them to build relationships. And I'd love to hear how you do that. But we always say, do it authentically with humility and mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to hear what your tips are on that. What what advice do you have for how people can reach out, build relationships mm -hmm. in a mutually beneficial manner? So one of the things that people will say when I ask them why they're not networking, here's how the conversation goes. We'll start talking or they'll say, I need help networking. And I'll say, okay, what's the problem? And they'll say, well, I know I need to be networking, but I don't know anybody or I don't know where to start. That's typically what people who are talking to me would say. That's why they're talking to me. If they knew, they'd be out doing it. So I always tell people the first step, or my first step, and I have a five-step process on this, but my first step is start with who you already know. If you think about most people in your life that you do already know, you met them because you went to school together, you lived in the same neighborhood, you were in the same community organizations, or you worked with them. And especially as we go through our professional lives, we accumulate a lot more connections who are former coworkers, people we worked with before, and we left that job and went to do something else, or they left the job to go do something else. But we all work together. So the people who are close to us geographically or organizationally are people we know. And we didn't pick them. We just got to know them. So you already have this network of people. The second way we meet most people in our lives is by getting introduced by other people. If you think about most people, if you were to go through who, who's in my circle of people that I know, that's probably one of two ways that you met them. Very few of us have a bunch of strangers we met on the street or on the train or on the bus or somewhere that are people in our lives. There might be a couple, but most people are not like that. So I tell people to start with who you know for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's easier because you just start making a list of people who you worked with or who you know. And usually people, not people you see every day, but people you lost touch with, people who you used to talk to on a regular basis and now you don't. And a lot of times those people cross our mind for whatever reason. And, and we're just like, wow, I haven't talked to them in a few years, but that's a good place to start. Again, if you really talk to them frequently and you had a relationship, if you reach out to them, they're likely to respond, right? So oftentimes, and especially on LinkedIn or social people are like, how do I send a message to somebody and reach out and get them to respond? I'm like, well, if you don't know them, you can try, but your response rate is going to be low. But if you spent that time reconnecting with all the people you do know, a lot of them are going to get back to you. It may take them a couple of weeks, but they'll get back to you. And so that's where I tell people to start. And typically people will think that's not networking. They say, I already know those people. They're in my network. And it's, yeah, but there's a lot of value in those people. There's a lot of opportunity in those connections that you already have. And because they'll respond, your risk of rejection is lower. There's a higher likelihood you're going to have a conversation with them. And as we go through the process, remember the second way we get to know people is by being introduced by other people. So we're going to work through a process where you get to a point where this person you already know is going to say, how can I help you? And you're going to say, can you introduce me to blank, either a specific person or a kind of person or somebody who works at the company you're interested in or does the thing you do. And they're going to introduce you and that introduction comes with an implied level of trust for the other person. So that person, again, is going to be more likely to respond to you and talk to you. And then it just is a cycle, right? And then you keep going through the cycle. So starting with you get together with them. And, and like I said, that's step one. Step two is to really have an 
you can connect with them online through LinkedIn or email or however you do it, but you really want to get to a voice to voice conversation, either video or on the phone. If you can do it in person, that's great. Not everybody lives in the same town you live in. Get to the conversation so you can really talk to them. And step two, make that happen. Set that up. Step three is listen and give. And what I mean by that is when you get in this conversation, people will say, what are we going to talk about? And I tell them, ask them about their favorite topic. And they'll say, what's that? And I say, it's the thing they know the most about. It's themselves. Ask people about themselves. Don't go into this saying like, here's what I need. Here's what you can do for me. Let me tell you about all my struggles with finding a job. It's, hey, what's going on with you? What have you been up to? We used to work together. What have you been doing since we last worked together? What are you struggling with? What challenges do you have? Mm -hmm. And as they talk, you want to listen to what they're saying and see what ideas pop into your head as ways to help them. Go into this with a giving mindset. And this is, again, one of the objections that people will throw out is, I don't like to network because it feels awkward. It feels awkward because you don't want to ask people to help you. You don't want to ask for things. You feel like you're taking advantage of people. And when you give to others first, it takes away a lot of that awkwardness. You don't feel awkward if you feel like you're helping the other person. So if you're giving them ideas, recommendations, book recommendations, introductions would be great. If you knew somebody you could introduce them to, you help them meet somebody, of course, they're going to want to help you meet somebody. So you're trying to give to the other person. So they sit there and they go, wow, Greg reached out to me. I haven't heard from him in a while. He set up the whole conversation. I didn't have to do anything. Then he asked me these great questions and, and really listened to me. And then he like gave me some ideas. I really want to help Greg. What can I do for you? And that's step number four is be easy to help, right? A lot of times people will say, oh, you want to help me? Here's my resume. Go give it to somebody who can find me a job. And that's like the worst thing you can do in that situation. That's like the way to blow this whole thing. And you know this, right? I mean, somebody giving you their resume and being like, hey, who do you know that's hiring? You're like, <laughs> yeah. do, I'll just do all the work for you. It's really, I want to help you, but that's hard for me to help you if you do that. If you say, hey, I'm interested in these companies and I would just love to learn more about them. Do you know anybody that works there? And you might not. You might look at that list and go, I, I don't know anybody. But you might say, hey, these companies are like this other company I know. They're kind of similar. And I do know somebody there. Would you like to meet them? Yes. Introduce me. I might learn about a company I never knew existed. Okay. I can send an email that says, Hey, Greg, meet Alan. He's looking to learn more about this. It'd be great if you guys could have a conversation. And you get introduced to somebody new, then you start all over again. And then you just have the conversation. You listen and give, you help them out. They ask how they can help you and you just keep doing that day in and day out. And then to me, that's my approach to networking. That's how I coach people to do it. That's what I tell them to do. But it takes away so many of the objections they have to why they don't network. And usually when I lay it out like that, people are like, it's so simple. It's just having a conversation with somebody. It's basic human interaction. And I, I'm like, yeah, it's basically everything that like you've heard about networking it doesn't work for you. This is another way to do it. Some people it works for, but not everybody. And so for the people who really just struggle with going into events and meeting big groups of people, this is a different way to do it and do it every day and just keep it going. And as you do this, opportunities come, opportunities happen. I might've missed this. I think you said it was a five-step process and I draw it down. Start with who you know, people that you're introduced to, listen to give, be easy to help. And was there a fifth one that I missed or? No, you're right. The fifth one is you have to make this a habit. Networking can't just be a project you do on a weekend. It can't just be something you do when you need a job. And to me, habits are important because habits aren't, again, something you do. They're, they're some, something you become. And so when it becomes a habit, you become a networker. You're not just someone who networks. You are a networker. And you want to create a habit of doing this, again, connecting with people, having these conversations, continuing to get introduced. And as you do that, that becomes a habit and that kind of keeps it going. That always keeps your network vibrant before you need it. And so again, if you get into that situation where you're like thinking, oh, I got to change careers, or I feel like the company's going to go through a reorg or whatever, you activate that network and then you don't, you don't get into this situation where you're like, oh my gosh, it's not happening. It's not quick enough. Networking takes time. It's slow. That process I just described, you can't do it in a weekend. You got to keep doing it 
all the time. I, I tell people it's like a garden, right? You can't plant the seeds today and hope you're going to be eating cucumbers tomorrow. Like that, that it's going to take time for them to grow. And so you've got to really nurture that. You've got to take care of it. And that's why it's important to make it a habit. So I want to dig in on a couple of these things. Number four, you said like, be easy to help. And you talked about, don't give me a resume. Mm -hmm. Don't have me try to figure out where the hell mm -hmm. to place your resume. And that's one of my pet peeves when people will DM me on LinkedIn or email me or whatever and say, hey, here's my resume. Mm -hmm. Can you look at it? And do you know anybody who is hiring a product manager in hardware sales? Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I don't even know you. So I'm not going to mm -hmm. be doing this for you. Plus, if it comes through on LinkedIn, it could be like a, a virus or something, mm -hmm. although I've only had that happen once. A couple of tips that I've offered people is when they're meeting with people, and I think you brought this up too, not only who else do you know that I can speak to, but who at these companies that I'm targeting do you potentially know? That That's a great thing. Mm -hmm. And also something that I've, I, I teach people is don't overwhelm them with mm -hmm. the number of companies you're thinking of. Keep it to like a list of five and then prompt the person you're talking to, which other companies should I be thinking about? Mm -hmm. And then let them just free form yeah. because if they don't know any one of those five companies, they might know someone, yeah. maybe they brought up Tesla and they're like, oh, I know my buddy P Paneet who just joined there. Mm -hmm. And let me introduce you to him. Yeah. So I, I like the open-endedness and I also like not having people yeah. to do work for you. Yeah. I think on the target company list for me, as it goes to being easy to help, the more specific you can be, the better, meaning yes. what can you do? The more specific, the better. I like the target company list with however many you want to put on there. Yeah. Don't overwhelm them. So it's got to be enough for them to have something to trigger their brain, but not so many that it's like, oh, I can't even look at this list. I like to tell people it should either be a physical piece of paper if you're meeting in person or an email that you send them that they can keep with them. Because oftentimes hmm. people will take it and they can't think of anything at the moment, but then you've primed their brain to think of those companies. And you are amazed at how often you start to see those companies, either their products or an ad for a job or something else pops up about the company later on. It's just like when you buy a red car, you suddenly see red cars, right? It triggers the availability bias in your brain so that the information that you just saw, all of a sudden you'll start to see that information everywhere. So if you tell people, if you got a bunch of people with your list out in the world, world, you've basically created what I would call opportunity scouts. They're people who aren't consciously out there looking for you, but when it crosses their mind and they go, oh, this was on Greg's list. I need to tell him about it. They can come back to you later and say, I know this was one of the companies you were looking at. You should totally check this out. And they're out there in the world. Now, is it foolproof? No. Is it going to happen all the time? hundred percent? No. But any advantage you can give yourself when you're looking for a new role is helpful. And trust me, nobody else is doing this. I say nobody, but most job seekers aren't doing this. If you're doing this and you're looking for a job and you're the one that's giving people your target company list, more people are going to be contacting you saying, Hey, I heard of this. You should check this out. Oh yeah. By the way, I know somebody at this company now. I remember let me put you in touch with them. And I love that term you use, opportunity scout. Mm -hmm. So the more people that you engage in your network, even mm -hmm. if you're doing it one-on-one, -on -one, as you're suggesting, and personally, I'm a lot more comfortable with that too, mm -hmm. the one-on-one -on -one conversation like this. But every conversation that you have, then those people know more mm -hmm. people and more people. It's a pyramid scheme, basically, for your career yeah. in some manner. And let's talk more about strategy in a second, but I, I just want to stress the importance of how important networking is and building those relationships are. So the stats that I've seen are that 7% of people apply through jobs through referrals, but 40% of people get hired because of referrals. So mm -hmm. there's a higher index of people that are referred. In my case, personally, 24 out of my 29 jobs I've had, door was open for me because somebody said, hey, Alan's a decent guy, you should speak to him. It doesn't mean that I didn't need to interview. Mm -hmm. And I got referred for a lot of other jobs that I have not gotten. Mm -hmm. And I have got interviews for jobs that I was not referred into, but 24 to 29 opportunities, including Google, including Facebook, including American Express, is because somebody vouched for me and put in a kind word on my behalf. Are there any other stats or data that you have to demonstrate like the importance of it? So then we can go more into the tactics. Yeah, you know, I've seen things like 70 or 80% or through networking. I don't know, that seems a little high, but I'm in the same boat. I think early in my career, it was less of that, but even- Right, like when you wrote a book, wrote away for a guide of how to get a job on the cruise ship, that was not through a network. Sure, sure. But I would say like, Outside of that one, 
if I think about every other job I've had since I got out of college and even my first job out of college, there was somebody who was there putting in a good word for me like even mm -hmm. campus recruiting. So I got recruited off of campus by Anderson Consulting at the time. And I went through their campus program, but I knew upperclassmen who already worked there, who had said, you should interview. And I know through those processes that I'm sure that when they were looking at the results of the interviews, there were people like, I know this guy, he's a pretty good guy. We should consider him. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I know that happened. And you can say that's not fair because they shouldn't be doing that. And I'll be like, whether it's fair or not, that's how this works, right? Yep. If and, and people will be like, I don't know those people. I don't have access to this people. I'm like, I knew upperclassmen who did things similar to me. They were the ones who said, you should consider this. And so I said, okay. So often college students are like, I don't know anybody. I don't have any contacts. I say, if you're on campus, there's upperclassmen, there's professors, there's graduate students, there's internships, there's alumni. There's a lot of people who you can connect with even if you're a student. So if I go back to that one, even that one had people helping me out. I went on the cruise ship and I told you I met my wife and we decided to get married and we moved back to New York City. We lived there for a couple of years after the cruise ship. And I called up the people I worked with before. It was now called Accenture, not Anderson Consulting. They said, yeah, we're hiring, come on back. I came right back into the role. From then on, I moved to Denver. I knew somebody at the first job I got here. Every job was like somehow there was some networking connected with it. Did I mm -hmm. have to go through the ATS and apply at some point? Absolutely. But only after I had already talked to somebody who was like, we'll get you in, we'll talk to you. Yes, I had to do well in the interview. Yes, I had to show up well. But those referrals got me in the door. It's like when you go to the club and there's like a big line and you see the people who know the bouncer, like they're just letting people in because they know the bouncer. That's getting into the club. I mean, that's letting you get in the door. You still got to get in the club and dance, right? When the time comes, that helps you get in the door. And again, I know there's people out there that will say, that's not fair, that it should be equal and everybody should come in through the same door. I don't disagree with you, but at the same time, that's not how the world works. So right. you might that's as well really play the game and learn how it's played to give yourself every opportunity. Community. Yeah. So you and I are in agreement. It's not fair that people get jobs mm -hmm. and people get things because of connections. The way you're on this podcast now is because Jenna, yeah. who I happen to meet just randomly on LinkedIn, because she commented on my comment mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. She's like, hey, I know this guy, Greg, he'd be a great podcast guest for you. Mm -hmm. We haven't even spoken before, but Jenna's word was good enough for me to say, hey, Greg, Greg would be a great guest for the podcast. Let's get him on. So right there was because of relationship building, because of networking. So how do people go about intentionally networking? Or do you, like my hunch is you're not suggesting random, just go up to like random people. Cause you say, start with the people, you know, that die is already cast. Then mm -hmm. people that you get introduced to, but what if there's a particular goal in mind? What if you wanted to work instead of saying, I want to work for a cruise line, but you wanted to work for Cunard or Carnival or whichever cruise line, and you wanted to focus on one of them, or you wanted to work at Google, or you want to work at Goldman Sachs, or you want to do something mm -hmm. like that. How, how would you advise people to go about as an introvert or, or anybody to start building those relationships, saying that you know nobody at Goldman Sachs, but that's a company that you really want to get into. Yeah, I think I would focus on letting the people I do know, that's what I want to do. And I'm not yep. saying put it on LinkedIn and post, hey, I want to work for these companies. You could try, give it a shot. I mean, what's the downside? Mm -hmm. Like nobody responds. Yeah. You could say, right. here's my target list and tag all those companies. It's a long shot. It may not work. But I would focus on those people I do know and just say, hey, here's what I'm interested in. Here's what I'm looking to do. Have you ever heard of anybody that works at any of these companies, whether they're connected with you on LinkedIn or there's somebody you personally know, I, I would just let people know, here's what I'm, I'm shooting for. Here's my targets. Now you might have everybody say, I don't know anybody. And in which case I would say, okay, now your goal is to try to start to connect with people. And LinkedIn is my platform. I post there all the time. You could do this on any, but I would think from a professional job search standpoint, that's probably where you want to start. If I couldn't find anybody in my network who knew anybody, I would start trying to find people who are active on the platform, who are either actively posting or actively commenting. So they may not post, but if they comment, then you could see what they comment on other people's posts. You could reply to their comments. 
start interacting and, and engaging with people to the point where they recognize who you are. You don't have to stalk them all over. You, you want to make this genuine and see if there's an opportunity to connect, become connections and start trading messages and try to move to that voice to voice conversation. That's going to take longer and it's not going to have the same hit rate. But again, if I went through my network and, and I couldn't find anybody and nobody knew anybody, that's where I would go next. Yeah. And another great thing about LinkedIn is you can leverage your commonality. So in your case, you said you got recruited by Accenture or Anderson. You went to Texas A&M. Yep. And I just looked on LinkedIn. There are 482,000 Texas A&M alumni on LinkedIn. So you can start using that. Yeah. Have you ever used any commonalities like that? Like yeah. someone who worked on a cruise line before mm -hmm. or someone that went to Texas A&M before or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Whatever. Anything you can do to try to make a connection with a person that you have something in common with. That's the key to trying to start having a conversation instead of just randomly reaching out to somebody and be like, hey, I see you work at Goldman Sachs. Would love to hear more about what that's like. Most people are not going to respond to that. They're, they're like, I don't have time to discuss with you. But if there's something else you have in common like you work at Goldman Sachs and we went to the same school, you might be able to have an opportunity. Oh, great. Somebody who's an alumni, I'll talk to them. I'm, I'm more likely to do that. So whatever commonalities you can find. And if somebody's, a lot of people, whether it's on LinkedIn or other stuff, they'll put things out on the internet and maybe they wrote an article. Maybe they were on a podcast. Maybe they did something and you see what they did and you listen to that and say, hey, I really enjoyed that. Here's what I thought of that. Here's my feedback and input. Most people are going to be like, great. Somebody paid attention to something I put out there. Happy to talk to you. I had a guy I met. I actually talked to him today and this was not for me, but he's actually looking for a role and I have a role and he matches it and he's going to apply. But I was on a panel that was online and he was on it and he interacted with us in the panel, in the comments. So I recognized who he was in his name. And so that when he reached out to me, I was like, oh, you were the guy that was commenting on the panel. Great. And he's like, hey, I'd love to talk to you about this role. So we had a conversation earlier today. Now, I don't know if it's going to work out or not. I don't know if he's going to be the guy. But I mean, he went from just being a guy who applied through the ATS or a random person who hit me up on LinkedIn to somebody who I know I interacted with him online, like I saw him. So I was more open to having that conversation with him than just some cold email or message that I got through LinkedIn. And that goes to your third step of listen and give. So this person was listening to you, gave back in terms of adding some added value comment. It wasn't a dumbass comment. Otherwise, you'd probably yeah. remember dumbass. I'm not talking to this guy. Mm -hmm. So it was either neutral or positive comment, but you recognize the guy's name. But your fifth one is very interesting. So you talk a lot about how to raise awareness, make it easy for people to help people. How do you make it a habit? So building relationships, having this network is not a one and done thing. I'm sure your network has increased significantly since the days of Texas A&M, of Accenture, and you're doing this on a regular basis and you're an introvert. So my hunch is, even though it probably comes naturally to you now because you've just habitized it, how did you make it a habit for yourself and how do you suggest other people make it a habit for them? I'm into habits anyway, but I would say the way I make it a habit is try to make it smaller, right? So this is in the vein of either Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg or Atomic Habits by James Clear. Find a way to make whatever you're doing smaller so it's something you can do every single day. So I always try to think of who is the person I want to become? What does that person do? What are the things that person does every single day? And for me, that first time I lost my job, I had to find a new one and I learned kind of how to network and I've refined it over time. I told myself, I don't want to ever be in that position again where I'm starting from scratch on my networking. So I resolved with myself to continue to network even though I didn't need a job, which is the best thing. If you're somebody who just landed a job, you should be networking right now. And it's a prime time because all you'll be doing is helping other people because you won't need anything and you'll build up so much goodwill and karma that like when time comes around, it, it will be no issue to ask people to help you. Yep. But that's what I did is I just said, I don't want to be in that situation again. So the first time I lost my job, it took me three months to land my next job, which isn't bad. That's 
pretty typical, I would say. What happened is I actually lost my job a second time. This was several years later. I could sense it was coming. You know what's going on with the company. Had the network activated, just got it going, started making all the connections, really had some things already lined up the day that I was told that I was being let go. I already had some stuff in the pipeline. I contacted those people. I was like, okay, ready to go. And I landed at my next job three weeks later. So it was like, I took, I turned months into weeks by keeping that networking going and really having it there when I needed it. To me, that was the power of it. I knew it was helpful and I knew it was beneficial. And quite frankly, I enjoy it. Just because I'm an introvert doesn't mean I don't like to talk to people. I enjoy talking to people, but on my terms, on my time frame, in a certain way. And so by doing this, it keeps me going and keeping my relationships going. And then again, the opportunities are there when I need them, if that's what happens with my day job. So you enjoy talking to people. You're also comfortable reaching out to people. Are there some tips that you would recommend for people, either reach out to people or things that have effectively worked for you so that you talk to other people, like someone commented on your talk. So that made it more open for you to talk to them. So you knew them, but what are some tips and tricks for people to reach out to arguably a complete stranger and start building a relationship? For me, the things that whenever somebody knows something about me, right, I probably put more out in the world online than most, right? Just by the nature of what I do. But even before that, I've had people who have read blog posts I've written or read articles that I've written and and they'll comment about that. And they're like, hey, I, I checked this out. I enjoyed it. Here's my thoughts on it. I'm like, oh, great. Let's have a conversation about it. It was about what I did. It wasn't, hey, I'm looking to do this. Can you help me do this? They made it about me. And again, like I say, everybody likes to talk about themselves. So if you engage somebody, you're like, hey, I loved what you said here. I'd love for you to tell me more about that. And if you invite somebody to tell you more, we all love to have an audience that's listening to us. And if you invite somebody to tell you more about what they're doing, they're going to be like more likely to do that than if you say, hey, let me tell you about something. Because I'm like, I don't care. Like what? I didn't ask for that. So find out what that person would want to talk about and ask them to tell you about it. Because most of the time people are like, great, I'll take time out of my day to tell somebody about something I'm interested in. And then once you do that, you're like, oh, this is great. You tell me about you. And you go, okay, I'll tell you about me. And then you start to have a conversation and you get to a point where you feel like, okay, maybe we can help each other. Not always. I mean, not every one of these interactions is some amazing new relationship, but if you're having an interesting conversation and you're asking good questions and, and you're letting the other person talk, we all love attention. Even more now, everybody's all about what attention can I get? If you're going to give somebody your attention, they're probably going to want to talk to you. They're probably going to be somebody that says, wow, you're great to talk to. I I, I think, again, I, I guess the tip, if I were to boil it down, is if you're reaching out to somebody cold, don't tell them what you want or tell them what you'd like to talk about. Say, I want you to tell me about the thing that you're really passionate about. And more than likely, somebody's going to be willing to say, okay, yeah, I would love to spend 15, 30 minutes telling you what I think. Yep. People love to talk about themselves and people love to give advice. You spend an hour of your time today joining me and my audience to give advice. I'm not paying you except for a thank you. (laughs) Sure. Um, And great appreciation, but you were welcome to do this and take valuable time out of your day to advise others, people you don't even know that are listening right now. So we're running a little low on time and I want to make sure that we have time for the last two questions Mm -hmm. I ask all my guests. The first one, you've offered lots of great advice here, lots of uh, great tips. What is one last piece of sick career advice you'd like to leave my listeners with? Start before you need it. I know that sounds simple and straightforward. Too many people say, I'll do this later. And the problem is you never know when you're going to need it. If you don't start now, when you do need it, it's going to be too late. Too many people have to go through that and learn that lesson. I learned that lesson that way. I learned it the hard way. And once I learned it, I said, I'm never going to do that again. But I will tell people and every person I talk to who's been through this and landed and figured out how to network and found a new job says, I'm never going to do that again. So if you've never gone through that situation where you got laid off or you really needed to find a job more quickly, start networking now. You all know you need to do it. You all say, I'll do it later, but start now. And even if you don't need a job, this is the best time to do it. The best time is when you don't need it. So that that would be my one piece of advice for anybody who's thinking, I I should network, I'll get around to it, I'll do it later. Later means never, just say, I'll do it now. 
And so say, I'm going to start today. I'm going to find one person who I used to work with, who I think about every once in a while that I've lost touch with. And I'm going to reach out to them today and get in touch with them and start a conversation with them. Just start with one person, see how it goes and then go from there. Awesome. And I, I love this saying, dig the well before you're thirsty. Yeah. So yep. similar with networking. And then the last question I have for you, Greg, is I know that people can find you on LinkedIn and your name is spelled G-R-E-G-R-O-C-H-E mm -hmm. for those that are listening. But how else can people reach out to you? How else can people learn from mm -hmm. your great wisdom? LinkedIn is a great place because there's links there to my newsletter, which is called The Introverted Networker. It's on Substack. So if you go on Substack and search The Introverted Networker, you can find it there. I publish it every Saturday morning and I put in best networking advice there for my readers. So that's a great way to connect with me. Or again, just look me up online. GregSRoche.com is my website, but any of those ways. And if you can't remember any of those, just go to LinkedIn and, and look me up there and, and you'll find my picture with a banner that says the introverted networker there. So you can follow me and comment on my posts, connect with me, send me a message. I'm always there to help teach introverts to be better networkers. Thank you, Greg, for joining on the podcast. I learned so much from you. I know our listeners have. And thanks for the, right. the daily inspirations that you, you leave on LinkedIn. Right. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Greg. Yeah.